Okay, Alex, let's hey, liven up this joint. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Um, so Alex Loristani is my boss um, at, and CEO and co-founder at Geltor. Um, he is a um, PhD microbiologist, med school dropout, rescuer of puppies, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and a fellow Twitter addict. Yeah. <laughs> cool, and I'm, I'm here with Aaron Kim, who is the creative director here at Geltor. And one of the earliest jellies on the team, I remember first meeting Aaron when you were at New Harvest, uh, working on sort of all things alternative protein, nonprofit, and uh, she's a total adventurer, you know, going from attorney to nonprofit to uh, really pioneering biodesign and, and bringing uh, some really amazing like creativity to what we're all working on here in the world of biology. So yeah, super pumped to uh, have this catch up. You're very yeah. kind, Alex. It's also been a really long time since we've seen each other in person because you've got a crazy schedule, so it's, it's nice to be back here with you. Um, so for those of us um, in the audience who've never heard of Geltor before, maybe it's worth like a quick reintroduction because the last time we were here was in 2019 before the pandemic. We were a much smaller, younger, company, um, and a lot has happened since then. So um, what's, how would you introduce Geltor to this world today? Yeah. Well, something that I like to say that I think this audience will actually get is Geltor is kind of like if Pixar and Genentech had a baby. I think that sort of gives you the, the feeling for the company. It's this like pretty magical combination of like creativity and desire to tell stories and create art with biology with like world-class pioneering science with a lot of focus on proteins and, and bringing proteins to life. So, you know, from a like pretty tactical perspective, like we brew fabulous proteins for some of the world's biggest companies. And today, like once every two or three seconds, uh, some consumer somewhere in the world buys a Geltor powered product, which is uh, still kind of mind boggling to me. Yeah, we're selling them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so what is it like um, for us as a biodesign company to actually have product to sell? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, thinking about, you know, where we were last time we were here in 2019, I think about the difference between, like, having a product to sell and having a product that, you know, big customers are sort of, like, ripping out of your hands. So, like, I think last time we were here, we, we had products to sell, and we had, like, one awesome customer, and we were figuring out, hey, how can we do a good job for them? How can we go learn from this customer and, and build from here? And over the past couple of years, the market for like the first uh, product that we created has, I mean, it's grown even more intensely than, you know, me and Nick were uh, optimistic entrepreneurs, right? But it's grown even more quickly than, than we could have imagined. So, you know, I think the um, uh, big difference between like where we were a few years ago and where we are today is like we had a product to sell a few years ago. And we're kind of like, you know, pushing it out there. We had some like super visionary customers that like wanted it so bad that they would like hunt us down. But today it's uh, it's intense and, and there's like really no feeling quite like knowing the moment for like the company and the product and uh, the team like has has arrived. It's like it's actually kind of terrifying, you know, to be totally candid at times. Um, but that's uh, it's fun having products to sell. I think it's even more fun having products that you know customers are just absolutely ravenous for. Yeah. It's an amazing feeling to actually just be walking through Sephora or Ulta or Target and being like, we made that. <laughs> um, cool. And do you have any insights um, from the past three years of actually selling our, our products um, that you might want to share with some of the other founders? Yeah. In the audience? Well, I think, you know, one of the, I, when we were getting ready for this catch up, one of the things that I did was go and look at my like my iPhoto library, and I went and found the picture of the first product that we ever brought to a customer, and it was like embarrassing, you know, looking back at that now. Uh, you know, we make uh, most of the products in our portfolio are these collagens, and they're like perfect, right? Like they're powders that just look like gorgeous, or they're solutions that are like perfectly clear, and like you just want to drink it like you could. Um, but that first one was ugly, like it was cloudy and like this weird, you know, really unappetizing kind of like yellow color and like the label, like me and I think Nick like figured out how to print it and it was just like, it was really bad. But 
we did it. <laughs> and we learned so much from that first, like, kind of gross product from those first customers that it we brought that it to. wasn't that bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, you know, it, it, looking looking at where we are today relative to that, like, you're right. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. It was, like, so important for us to be okay with, I mean, be, being shameless, right? And just saying, hey, listen, like, we don't have this figured out. Like, nobody has it figured out, but we're going to go work with our customers to build something that is great, but you got to start somewhere. So I think one thing is, like, you know, don't wait too long to get that product, one, like, made, uh, and then, two, actually get it in front of a customer so that they can tell you what they love about it, what they hate about it. Uh, that, like, experience totally change the trajectory of the company because we had you know scientists like sitting around thinking about what hey like this is what customers would like or hey this would be a really cool collagen to make sort of like some concepts but the questions that they asked that were really like inspired by uh, that first prototype it it took us to places from a design perspective that you know we we nece we wouldn't have necessarily gone like especially in beauty and personal care so i mean one piece of advice is just like build products that you're embarrassed of um, and, and get them out there because no one else is going to do it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And we're not selling to ourselves. Yeah, yeah, we're not selling to ourselves. The other thing, uh, you know, thinking back to, again, 2019. So this was the first year when we were selling product. We had like one big customer. And thank God they didn't know. I don't even know if I should say this here, but like thank God they didn't know what was happening behind the scenes because they – wound up buying way more product than they initially said they were going to buy. And we had to go figure out as a company, we did the math like really quickly when the, the POs started kind of like rolling in more intensely. We were manufacturing at like 300 liter, we were manufacturing a pilot plant essentially, right? Like at 300 liter scale. And when we figured, okay, we're going to need to make a lot more of this, we essentially said we're going to have to manufacture it every single 300 liter fermenter like in, in the country. So like, the team, you know, we, I mean, you saw this, like, there are a few crazy things. It One, was wild. Yeah, it was wild. So, like, you know, team flying to, like, every 300 liter fermenter in the country, like, that was really tough. Uh, I, I remember Nick and, you know, someone else on the team driving from our place in San Leandro with, like, I, I don't know if it was, like, a minivan or what, but, like, a mini. Think it, it was a U-Haul? Yeah, it was, I, it was a, yeah, it was, like, something we rented to take, like, a set of HPLC so we could set up like an analytical lab like at one of these manufacturers and like basically like driving overnight to, to, to Utah or something. Maybe got a few uh, speeding tickets. Yeah, yeah, speeding tickets and everything. So, you know, it's none of this is pretty, right? Like, you know, none of it works like how you would imagine it sort of like in theory. Um, but, you know, that's how you actually, you know, help customers. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, elegant initially. It's a lot more elegant today, uh, but you need to, you know, prove that there's something there um, in the first place. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, we learned so much from that chaos. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that actually brings me to the next um, point, which was that we recently wrapped our first commercial scale manufacturing campaign for Primacol, our first animal-free collagen for food and beverage. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that means for us and the industry and why that matters? Yeah, so, you know, it was a big deal for us because I think, it, you know, one of the one of the sort of, you know, memes, and for good reason, in synthetic biology is, okay, great, so, you know, you can make this in the lab or, you know, do it at pilot, but, you know, can you make this at scale, right? Can you make this at a scale that can support a real business, that supports real customers? So, you know, this, you know, fixation over the past five years, the, the sort of meme of the past five years was, great, well, can it scale? Um, today, it's uh, capacity, right? You know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the new thing because companies like Jeltor have been able to demonstrate that you can take it to full scale. But the big question, you know, existential question for us was, can we do what we've demonstrated in the lab at pilot, at demo scale, but you know, at the largest scales for food and nutrition and, and other markets that we're entering. So it was a big deal because I mean, the company is a totally different company if you can't, if you can't do that. Um, uh, you know, we like to say now that this is, this, the, the process is basically idiot proof, right? Like, you know, being able to move on from like scaling up and really investing primary resources in scaling up now focusing on scaling out. How can we take this process that we uh, scaled in partnership with Lanza, now known as Arxada, out to facilities uh, across the world? 
Um, so it was, it was a big deal for us. It was company, it was company defining stuff um, for sure. Any uh, learnings there that you might want to share? Yeah, you know, I think the, and I'm, I'm curious to get your perspective on some of this too. Like when um, I remember when we were first thinking about, hey, who are like the large scale manufacturers that, and CMOs that we can work with to, to demonstrate this? Meeting with um, uh, someone who was the, we invited uh, this guy was the former CEO of Evolva um, to, you know, get, get some advice, like what their experience was like, and specifically around, you know, picking the right manufacturing partner. And one of the things, he had this list. It was like a way, lo it was a way longer list than I thought it was going to be, because in my mind, it was like, okay, like you need to make sure that they have capacity, you need to make sure that they have the right sort of, you know, fermenters, they have the right sort of downstream that, uh, you know, they're, they're reputable, et cetera. But like, his list was like, you know, this long. I thought it was gonna be this long. And actually a lot of the things that we wound up discussing was, hey, like you're gonna be spending, your organization and their organization are gonna be spending a lot of time together. Like it's not just like engineer to engineer. Um, it is like attorney to attorney. It is, uh, it, you know, communications director at the time to communications director over there. Um, it is like, you know, executive to executive. So the, the cultural match between the two organizations wound up, I think, being one of the kind of critical uh, success factors for us because, you know, some of the other partners that, you know, we were, you know, considering that we've interacted with, that just like wasn't quite there um, uh, for, for, this particular, for this particular thing. So I, I think that the culture match between, you know, now Arxada and Jeltor in, in that was a really big deal. Uh, and I think that mentality with any partner that you identify you know, we'll, we'll take that really seriously moving forward. Yeah, I agree. That was a very good experience um, for me too. They were, they were, I found very understanding and patient with us. I learned a lot and um, I, I like to think we made a, a good impression and that they want more, I mean, they want to work with more of you guys. So um, yeah, it was, it was good. Um, and so now we're coming up on almost seven years, right, of Gel Tour. And I remember, seeing your and Alex or sorry, your and Nick's um, pitch on Facebook Live in 2015 when you guys were doing indie bio demo day and um, you know it's funny I had this like weird I, I liked you guys right away and I didn't realize at that point that I would ever be working at gel tour but here I am um, and I'm just wondering now that we've we've been through so much you know growing product portfolio, new markets being entered into. Um, we're manufacturing at commercial scale, of course, and um, we're about to move into our new um, jazzed up new space in Emeryville in July. Lots more, but do you have any, what would you tell yourself back then? And uh, do you have any like reflections on your founding experience that you wanna talk about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think in, in in my case, you know, I like to say I was the first person at Gel Tour that Nick hired, right? Like, and, and I think that's one of the biggest lessons for me uh, and thinking about what the journey's been like for other founders over that time. I mean, there's nothing more important than who you start the company with and who the first, you know, few people, right? We're still small, like we're 80, 85 people on the team right now. Um, uh, the, the Every single person that you work with and uh, build the company with has such a huge impact on culture. Um, so, yeah, I mean, thinking back to the earliest days, you know, making sure that you are more excited than anything about working on big, important problems that are going to be really hard to solve uh, with someone that you admire and that, like, you're inspired by and that you think is special. Um, because nothing's going to work the way you think it is. <laughs> but, you know, if you have that, uh, uh, that, that mutual sort of, you know, connection, you, you can figure it out. Um, so I think that's one, like, you know, co-founder selection, you know, this is no surprise to anybody, but like, it's one of the greatest joys of building a business. It, it can also be one of the greatest, you know, quagmires in building a business. So I think that's one. The other thing is like, you know, there's, give yourself like, you know, be humble, but like give yourself credit. Like no one has the playbook for whatever it is you're excited about working on. Um, other people may have tried what you're excited about and, and, and not succeeded. That doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. Um, it just means like it didn't work that time. Uh, you may see other companies that like feel kind of similar, but like no one there is gonna know exactly what you're gonna need. Like every company's different. So I think, you know, be, uh, at the end of the day, it's like your company, right? Like it's on, it's on you to, 
to lead the team and, and do the things that you got to do to uh, to make it happen. So you know, I think uh, there, there, there's no one. You know, sometimes you say no one's coming to save you, right? Like no one's coming to save you. So like you know, don't forget that. There's not like a unicorn that you can go and hire that's going to go and have every single answer that you need to have. It's like you need to like lead this person, inspire this person, and like get the best out of them. Uh, but they're they're a person just like you. And I, I I think that you know founders. I've I've fallen into this trap too myself. Like sometimes founders like forget that, right? It's like oh, like if only we could get this person. They've done this exact thing at this other company. Um, no, we're figuring out new stuff like every single day. Mm -hmm. So don't forget that. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to get spicy? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> we got a few minutes. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, we have some lofty aspirations, some that we kind of keep to ourselves. Um, <laughs> tell, can you say more about um, your kind of grander motivations as a CEO and what maybe yeah. eggs you're yeah. w willing to crack. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the so Aaron and I, when we were getting ready for this, it was like, you know, how can we talk a little bit about the, you know, sort of like personality of the company and like, you know, personality of Nick. And, you know, as, as a company, it's primarily, you know, selling to other businesses. Like, you know, there are people CEOs at these other businesses that, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to make the difference, right? Like, and one of the things that, you know, we keep coming back to is the thing that, you know, gives me a ton of energy is helping the good CEOs beat the bad CEOs. And by that, I mean, you know, you see a ton of people, right? Like today, you'll see plenty of conversations around um, the mandates that big companies, in our case, like consumer companies, are making publicly around reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, land and water use, uh, or, or other things like that. Um, and you can really clearly see the ones that are just saying it and not actually like, you know, rolling up their sleeves and working with their teams to make sure that like people are taking it seriously and like organizing plans around making that stuff happen uh, and the ones that don't. So I think one of the most you know powerful things that you can do as a you know B two B CEO, like especially like in this category where you know, I, I think that's kind of that would categorize most of us, is think about like one you know is, is the person that you're talking to at the other company a good CEO or bad CEO, um, and two how can you help the good ones right? How can you help her him them win right and beat beat the ones that aren't good. <laughs> um, uh, and I, th I think that's what we've seen like over the years. Uh, the, the things that like really make a difference for our business are the relationships with other you know, CEOs or executives that are good and that are taking these things seriously and that want to make a difference uh, for their companies uh, and helping them build an edge um, over their competitors. What are some of the signs of a good CEO? And Maybe even a bad one. Yeah, I mean, the, the good CEO you can see it. You can see what they're saying publicly permeate through their entire team, and they don't need to spend like you know four or six weeks you know getting to consensus on the thing. Like they know exactly what is important. W you see it coming all the way from the CEO through like procurement, right? Like it is the the entire organization is like dripping in what you know this like leader has committed to making happen publicly. Uh, it with the bad CEOs like. It's just compl it's it's vaporware, right? Like it it is something that they said, and that they're not taking seriously. And ultimately, like we see, we already see that this is what's pretty cool. So like you know we see in the orders that are coming from these companies, the ones that are like moving most aggressively to go and meet their goals, right? And then we can at the same time see the ones that never quite get there. Um, so so much proof is in the PO, yes. like many different yes. kinds of proof. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. 22 seconds. Um, yeah. uh, on that bad CEO thing, I, I guess, you know, I don't know if I want to say this, but um, I just feel like, oh, 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, I won't name names. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm not going to name names, yeah. but I feel, I feel like, as, like all of us here in, in biotech or whatever we're going to call this industry, because like it's still up for, it's, it's not settled yet. Like, yes, there's some... Um, baggage you know historically yeah. and and it's not like bad stuff it's just like i feel like i, I can't wait for the products to start speaking for themselves yeah. you know and i think i feel like we're 
we are just getting started, but we've that ball is rolling for us, and I just can't wait for all that lies ahead for us this year, next year, and beyond. And um, I, I actually don't even know why I said that, but there you go. Cool. Yeah. Well, this has been. Hey, I see we actually have a couple. It's so like <laughs> they you know, keep giving it, us more time. It, essentially, because <laughs> it's like so. Yeah, I'm I'm curious, Aaron. Like you know, walking around here, like at at um at the at this meeting, like. You see a lot of different ways of uh, biology, synthetic biology companies like representing themselves. You know, what have you? Basically, like I think a few years ago, it was like, oh, like you're either B two B or you're B two C, and like you got to look this way, you got to look this way. I think yeah. if you walk by, you know, our booth at least, yeah. um, you see that like that's like there is no rule around that. Yeah. Like, what's your philosophy around that? Like, why do we look the way we look? <laughs> yes. Um, well, okay. It, it says zero. Um, but maybe I'll keep talking until they yank us yeah. off. Yeah. Um, so I mean, B two B was always, it was code basically for ugly, and um, you and I remember when I first came on and I was communications director at that time. But we were so small and scrappy that we were all wearing many different hats. It still are, frankly. But um, I thought, oh, okay, well, I'm I'm new, and and these are like the hollowed halls of biotech, and so I have to kind of play along with what everybody else is doing. And it took me some time to realize like, that's not the way. And there was, I mean, it, it's it's really scary to kind of like do something new and um, take huge risks and be met with, I've never seen that before. Like, yeah, you haven't seen it before. You're not, you're not gonna see it before and that's good. And I think all of us should be doing more of that and um, not stop looking at the lowest common denominator. And, and I mean, we're all, we talk a lot about wanting to change the world and, and this and that, and it's not gonna happen unless more of us take you know, individual and collective risks. And we, I'm very thankful that you and Nick allow me to do that creatively at Geltor, and I wanna see more of us do that, and I want us to do more of that in ways that aren't just in brand, too. Okay, maybe we should, maybe we should stop it there, although we, we have plenty more spicy takes yes. if you wanna catch us. Come by the booth. At, yeah. Off mic. Thanks, Thank Aaron. Thanks, everybody.